Welcome to Dental Business Rx. Practice success in 30 minutes or less. Thank you for calling ABC Dental. Am I overstaffed? Am I understaffed? How many staff should I actually have? I get these questions or variations of them quite a bit. And of course, my answer really depends based on the given situation. But that said, when I'm asked this question, there were a few specific things I check in every instance that I felt would be worth sharing if the idea of staff complement has been on your brain and you're trying to figure out where you stand. So for this week's episode, we're going to look at how to determine, a few tips on this on how to determine the proper staff complement for your practice so that you can answer that overstaffed, understaffed question for yourself. My name is Jeff Bloomberg and I'm your host. And I think the best place to start is by looking at why this even becomes a question and what area of a dental practice it normally pertains to. Generally speaking, when I get a question like this, it's related more more often than not to administrative staffing, the front desk. Very rarely does it have to do with back office, you know, the staff, associates, hygienist, etc. Why? Well, one word, familiarity. If you're the average doctor, you are intimately familiar with, with what happens in the back office. You know, you have a, a, a deep understanding of what the workload would be for your dental assistants, your associate, your hygienist, etc. Okay, so you don't really have a big question about do I need more or less staff because one, you could pretty much do all of the jobs that people are doing in the back. And two, even if there are cases, let's say, where you could do it faster, Uh, you have some idea of what an acceptable level of speed is for an employee in these areas and therefore can accurately determine what the actual workload is. So usually, there's no problems in determining if you're over or understaffed in the back office. There is one exception, though. And it's a bit of a, I don't know the right word to use, it's a bit of a roundabout way of explaining it. But let's say it's you, one hygienist, and two dental assistants in the back. But your practice has 4,000 charts, okay? So there's the scenario. It's you, hygienist, two assistants, but you have 4,000 charts. So theoretically, if you were to take those 4,000 charts, you in theory should have at least three, if not more, hygienists. And I'll explain why. I mean, I've covered this on the program before, but just in, in, in brief, because this is usually a big area of lost opportunity, if you have 4,000 charts... Uh, that would be or equate to at least 8,000 recall appointments a year. That's just with six-month recall. Now, let's say 40% of those charts are difficult to get back in, which is a pretty – I'm being fairly conservative there. It's a large number, right? So if 40% of these 8,000 recalls, you have trouble getting in. That still leaves you with – that's 3,200 people, 40%. That leaves you with 4,800 recalls a year with these 4,000 charts. So if you have 4,800 recalls a year and you work 50 weeks a year, that's 96 recall appointments per week. So if you have 96 recall appointments per week, and I apologize for the math, if, especially if you're listening to this in the car, but it's, it's pretty basic. I'm about done with it. But if you have 96 recall appointments a week and the average hygienist can see eight patients a day, that is 12 days of hygiene per week if you were at a decent level of compliance in your hygiene department but you only have one hygienist. In theory, you should have, with those 12 days of hygiene, if you're open four days a week, three hygienists, but you probably need more because that doesn't account for scaling and root planings. Or if you run new patients through hygiene, uh, you'd probably need more hygiene. So you might end up needing four hygienists. So we took this one doc office with one hygienist, and they really need four if they were at maximum compliance, or not even maximum, but decent compliance. Well, if you had four hygienists or even three and a half hygienists, there's a really good chance you're going to need an associate doctor. You're going to be too busy. You can't spend your entire day being the hygiene check doctor, okay? And most likely, the amount of traffic that's going to create in the practice is going to require probably another full-time associate. So in theory... With that 4,000 chart office, you technically are understaffed. But based on your current iteration, you're really not because of the amount of traffic coming into the practice, if that makes sense. So, yeah, I wouldn't go out and hire all those people yet. What I would do instead is dial back a bit and go, well, okay, 
why are those 4,000 patients not all coming in? All right. See, that, that answers, that, that actually leads to the real problem with this whole under overstaffed issue, right? And the reason they're not coming in is who is supposed to call those 4,000 patients in? Well, think about it for a second. It's your front desk, your administrative staff. That's why those 4,000 patients aren't there. Your dental assistants aren't going to call them. Your associate's not going to call them, which you don't have one in this iteration. Your hygienist is not going to call them. It's the front desk. And here's where we run into unfamiliarity normally on the part of the doctor. And like I said, this is where I tend to get the most questions, okay? Why? Because the doctor doesn't really understand what's actually involved with running at the front desk. You know, you go up there and you see people calling people and scheduling people. And usually where we lose it is when we see somebody dealing with insurances because nobody wants to look at that. So we just walk away at that point. And, you know, we're, we, we notice it when there's holes in the schedule. That's when we, we, we get really interested in the front desk. But if you think about it, if things were rolling along smoothly, you would probably have hardly ever walk up there except to say hi to your team members, okay? But that's a bit of a problem as a business owner if you're only familiar with one area of your business because the area that you're not familiar with is the area that can then potentially hurt you, that unfamiliarity. So the first thing to understand, if you really want to understand what's happening at your front desk and what the workload is, and you could apply this really to any position, right? There's a few things. Number one is that every position has two types of traffic. There's incoming traffic and outgoing traffic. Okay. If I'm a scheduler, um, I'm calling people on the phone. That's outgoing traffic. And then I'm handling patients when they're in the practice. You know, that's incoming traffic or patients are calling me to schedule appointments. That's incoming traffic. You could look at any position and it has incoming and outgoing traffic. Okay. So what can happen is the position is handling all the incoming traffic, incoming rather, and they have zero time for the outgoing traffic. So you've got that busy office, and let's, let's say your administrative staff in that example I'm giving here are uh, an office manager. You know, so you've got the one doc, the one hygienist, the two dental assistants. At the front, we have an office manager who also acts as the treatment coordinator and the financial coordinator. So they're doing all the insurance verif and filing insurances and sorting accounts and all that type of a thing, as well as sitting in with you during treatment presentations, as well as being the office manager. And then we have another person who's answering the phone and scheduling patients. So we have two people up at the front, an office manager and a receptionist slash scheduler, okay? So you could walk up there and they seem sort of busy, but all they're handling is incoming traffic, patients calling into the practice, rescheduling patients, uh, handling inquiries from patients, dealing with insurance traffic, et cetera. So what happens in a situation like that when you on those positions, they have no time for outgoing traffic is you get these ups and downs in the practice. As a matter of fact, I talked about this in an episode a while back called The Cycle of Booms and Depressions. I'd recommend you check it out. I don't have the episode number here in front of me. But if you search the, um, the list of previous episodes, you'll find it. The Cycle of Booms and Depressions. That's when you get it because essentially what's happening is the people at the front just are handling what, the people who are calling in. So what's the result? I'm handling incoming traffic and then I don't have time to do any outgoing calls because it's so crazy busy and I'm checking patients out and this and that and whatever. So then people, there aren't, the schedule starts to empty out. So when the schedule starts to empty out, there's no patients there. What do I do? I get on the phone and I start calling people again. You get the flow here. So if you have positions where all they can do is deal with the incoming traffic and they don't have time to get into outgoing traffic, you're going to run into problems. Hence, in this example I'm giving you, they have 4,000 charts, the majority of which are not active. They become inactive. And any chart, the longer you leave a chart with no communication, the more chance you have of that person never showing up again. And this is a situation in most dental practices. A lot of effort is spent on getting the patient into the practice as a new patient. And then when they're there, presenting treatment, et cetera. But then let's say I accept whatever treatment plan you present, you put me on the hygiene schedule, and then I don't show up. Well, there's very little follow-up that's done on me. The longer you let me drift into the ether, the less chance you have of recovering me. Okay, And the only reason I would be allowed to drift into the ether is nobody has time to pick up the phone. In most cases, if someone actually had time to call me, they would call me. But in this scenario I'm giving you here, that receptionist scheduler is too busy handling the new patient calls and the people that are there and helping check patients out when the office manager is busy, etc. They don't have time to call 4,000 patients. 
You see? So you have to look at every position from the perspective of what are they supposed to handle that's, you know, flow coming in and what are they supposed to do flow going out? I'll give you another example. Take a treatment coordinator, for example. Most treatment coordinators, when we think of a treatment coordinator, this is somebody who's going to sit in with you during a treatment presentation and work out financial arrangements. All right. And, you know, I've talked about this at length before. You, the doctor, should be presenting how much the treatment plan costs and the treatment coordinator can go off with them to figure out exactly how they're going to pay and get them to pay and do the financial app and all that kind of jazz. Right. But how many hours a day are they actually doing that? Probably not full time. And if they were, you probably need a second treatment coordinator because here's why. I sit in with you. Let's say I'm your treatment coordinator. I'm sitting in with you for four, let's say four presentations a day. What am I supposed to do with the rest of my day? Well, I'm supposed to be calling patients to A, follow up presentations that didn't close that were recent. Let's say we met with a patient last month and uh, they said they really wanted to do the treatment plan, but they were refinancing their house and they couldn't apply for credit right now. But their their house is supposed to close the refinancing, which I guess in this day and age right now with when I'm recording this episode, refinancing is not the best idea, but whatever. They're refinancing their house. Um, and I'm supposed to call and follow up because that should have closed by now so they can be ready to apply for credit, right? Um, and then let's say I've done all the follow-ups I'm supposed to do for patients who uh, didn't pay for you know a, a fairly valid reason. Well, what should I be working next when I'm not sitting in with you for a consultation? Well, I should be following up on other patients. You have a big old incomplete treatment list. Um, and you know, depending on the office, I've seen this list go into the millions. Well, I should take that incomplete treatment list and I should be calling patients off this list. Now, very often people will think, you know, well, call these patients, see if they want to do the treatment. I probably wouldn't. You're going to always end up with an anomaly, but that is usually the exception, not the rule. When you call the incomplete treatment list, here's, you know, Bill, and you presented a three crowns and an onlay last time they were there and they didn't accept, they were going to think about it. If I call Bill three months later, chances are Bill's not going to go, oh yeah, I'm glad you called. I decided to do the treatment plan. I mean, that happens from time to time, but that's very rare. But what would I do with Bill? Well, if Bill is overdue for hygiene and I'm the treatment coordinator, I'm going to schedule him for hygiene because I can get him back in, get him back in front of you as the doctor again, and then I'm there and we can present this treatment plan again, right? If Bill's not overdue for hygiene and we want Bill, you want to talk to Bill again, I might call Bill back in so you can have a look at their mouth again and see if everything's staying stable. I'm creating more sales opportunities for both the doctor and myself as the treatment coordinator. I have to have time for these follow-ups. If I'm doing eight or nine presentations a day and I don't have time for these follow-ups and no one's calling them, they drift away. It's wasted opportunity. So if you have a treatment coordinator sitting in for five, six presentations a day, uh, that might eat up most of their day and then they have a minimal amount of time for follow-up at that point. But you have to, if you're going to understand any position, you have to un have to understand how much time should they be spending outgoing versus handling the incoming traffic. So you'd have to examine it based on the individual given situation, right? And whether you like it or not, it's something that if you own a business, you just have to, I'm, I'm, I'm not saying as the doctor, you have to understand the, I don't know, all the anomalies and the missing tooth claws of XYZ plan. You really don't. But you at least have to understand how that financial coordinator position works or the treatment coordinator position works and an idea of their traffic flow and load. What normally grabs the doctor's attention or the office manager's attention in some cases is when the position is not able to keep up with the general incoming traffic. So for example, if you walk by the front and you see a receptionist on the phone with a new patient and they're having to put the new patient on hold because the phone is ringing and then while they're talking, they, they put the person that they're talking to on the phone on hold because another patient is now at the front trying to check out and another patient at the same time is walking in to check in. Well, that becomes painfully obvious that, okay, I need to get you know, him or her some help up here or they're going to end up in trouble. They're going to blow off new patients because new patients don't like being put on hold. Patients are going to wait, etc. That becomes painfully obvious, okay? But we're not going to necessarily notice that this receptionist who we also have scheduling patients is not keeping up with uh, – we'll, we'll notice when there's openings in the schedule. But we won't notice that there's a 1,000 people who are overdue for hygiene – that they're not calling. Do you see? So we have to, in order to properly understand a position, you have to understand the basic functions of the position, not just the basic duties that they're supposed to do when patients are inside the practice, but the outgoing communication that this position is supposed to have and stay on top of. You know, and one thing I will mention, and I've offered this before, 
if you wonder how healthy your hygiene department is, like, are we healthy? You know, how much, how many hygiene patients should we be seeing, specifically recall patients? You can download uh, something we call the um, hygiene formula. It's a little spreadsheet. You enter a couple numbers and it spits a number out to you with how many patients you should be seeing in hygiene. I'll put a link to it on the episode webpage if you want to check out how healthy your hygiene department is and, you know, how much expansion or room for growth that you have. And, you know, to apply this, let's say we took a look at this scenario I've been painting. One doc, one hygienist, two DAs, OM, and a front desk person who's like receptionist scheduler, right? I have 4,000 in active charts. We're assuming that my receptionist is keeping up with current traffic and my office manager is keeping up with current traffic. What would I do in this instance? Well, obviously, they're keeping up with current traffic, but chances are they're not going to have time to stay on top of these 4,000 charts that are inactive or 3,000 charts that are inactive. I probably need to hire somebody to actually reach out to those patients. Obviously, I'm going to do more than phone calls. I'm going to do emails, texts, patient newsletters, uh, you know postcards, et cetera, to get these patients back in on the schedule. But you probably need another set of hands at that point because you don't have enough people to stay on top of your patient base. You just don't, okay? And then what will happen from there, because we're going to staff as we expand. I don't want to overstaff to where I have somebody sitting around twiddling their thumbs, right? As the practice gets big, busier now, I've got the second hygienist. Now we're looking at adding a third. I might need an associate now. I might need another dental assistant. I might need somebody else at the front. This is how I'm you know, keeping my place properly complemented because I don't want to get it to the point where we're redlining, You know, like we're running to the point where we're about to burn the engine out because the current staff that I have can't keep up with the incoming traffic and not only can't keep up with the incoming traffic, have no time for the outgoing traffic, right? So that's basically what I would look at. You have to analyze each position, get an idea of what's actually involved with the position, not just the day-to-day duties in the practice, but the things that this person should be doing to reach out to your patient base or reach outside of the office, and then look at their workload and look if they actually have enough time to do that. It's very easy to analyze how many calls are coming in a day, especially in this day and age, Um, how many responses we're getting from marketing, et cetera. That's another thing to think with, too. If all of a sudden I double or triple my marketing, it's not like I, unless my front desk was just completely unbusy and I was looking at laying somebody off, there's a good chance I might have to add a staff member or somebody to keep up with that marketing traffic because you start to dilute its effectiveness at that point. Think about this for a second. If I'm getting, I don't know, six or seven new patient calls a day, which is not unusual, and then I do some marketing that really hits and now I'm getting 20 or 30 new patient calls a day. Well, on paper, that sounds great, right? Well, you know, I get six or seven calls a day and we schedule five. That's pretty good. But now I'm getting 30 a day. Do I actually, does the person who is answering the phone or who is scheduling these new patient calls, does that person have adequate time to effectively handle these phone calls? Probably not based on their current workload. Think about that for a second. If the average new patient call, let's say, in your practice takes uh, seven or eight minutes, right? Well, they get seven calls a day now. That's 56 minutes. It's it's like an hour. Let's call it for for ease's sake here. They get 30 calls. Okay, that's 240 minutes. That's four hours on the phone. They don't have the time. So what's going to happen at that point is you're going to have this big win and then a big loss. You're going to see your new patient calls go up out through the roof and you're going to be all excited, but then your new patients won't necessarily commensurately increase because you've diluted the receptionist's ability to actually handle those calls like they were handling when you were only getting six or seven. So this is where from a workload perspective, and this is just part of your executive hat, so to speak, you have to understand the position. You have to understand the incoming traffic this position handles and how much time it takes, as well as what's involved in the outgoing traffic. Then you'll be able to answer this question for you. This is why I can answer it just because I listen to somebody explain it to me and then I'm like, oh, yeah, I get it. Uh, I can start to understand what's going wrong. These are all basic common sense things. You know, for instance, if you're, you have an office manager – Let's say you have a bigger office, right? You have an office manager. You have somebody answering the phones, somebody scheduling patients. You might even have a part-time person doing reactivation, and you have a financial coordinator, okay? Maybe it's two docs and a few hygienists, right, and some assistants. So again, let's paint this. OM, part-time reactivation person, scheduler, receptionist, and let's say I also have a financial coordinator handling insurance. All right, so due to the traffic that's coming into the practice – 
we're doing four or five treatment presentations a day between our two or three hygienists and our associate doctor and myself, right? So who's the treatment coordinator? Well, we let our financial coordinator present really small cases, you know, if it's like 2000 bucks or whatever, because they're not very good at selling. So most likely in that scenario, the office manager is being the treatment coordinator. And this is not unusual at all. It's usually the last hat that the office manager stops wearing because the office manager usually can sell and has been with the practice the longest. Well, if the office manager is spending four, five, six hours a day in case presentations, all right, um, number one, they're not going to have time to actually be the office manager, which is a problem. And, you know, If you're an office manager listening to this, I have to warn you about this in a sense. It's very glorious and fun to close these big cases. Everybody is excited about it. It's very valuable to the practice. It's very valuable for the patient. But ultimately, as the office manager, you're supposed to properly get people to do their jobs, right? Not necessarily do them yourself, uh, especially if traffic justifies hiring somebody else, okay? In that case, you most likely have to bring in a treatment coordinator because your office manager, A, doesn't have time to do their normal job and be the treatment coordinator, and B, because they are the office manager and they're spending four or five hours a day doing treatment presentations, they don't have the time to fully wear that treatment coordinator hat, which includes also outgoing action. Do you see? Same thing with a scheduler. If I have a scheduler in this scenario and I have four, five, six thousand charts and we really only have one or two thousand active, I don't know that that scheduler is going to be able to keep two doctors and three hygienists busy and find time to call these thousands of inactive charts. They're probably not, which is why in this case, the scenario I painted, we have a part-time reactivation person. Do you see? So it's a matter of when you're trying to distribute workload, you're looking at, again, I know I keep saying this, incoming traffic coming into the business as well as outgoing traffic that this person should be engaging in. Another way of looking at this, and it's a little bit of an unusual way of looking at this, you know, whether you're under or overstaffed or if there's something wrong with your staff complement, goes back to finance. And I've talked about this before in a prior episode, but generally speaking, from an overhead perspective, your staff payroll should not exceed 22.5% of your revenues. If we're doing 100000 a month, my staff payroll should not exceed, including payroll taxes, 22500 not including the doctor owner or associate doctors, but it does include the office manager, hygienist, etc. So where this can get a bit murky is if I'm involved in a lot of PPOs or low fee type plans. So work with me on this for a second. So let's say if we do a hundred a month at PPO fees, what would that be at full fee? Probably a hundred and fifty in most cases, maybe a little less, but I think it's safe to say if you take a look, if you're in a lot of PPOs and you were to extrapolate that into your normal full fee, instead of that $880 PPO crown, it's a $1,500 crown. And then you look at what would you have produced or collected otherwise, it would probably be 150. So 100 PPO, 150 full fee. Well, let's say your payroll is $30,000. Okay. Well, if I did 150 and collected 150 and my payroll is 30,000 bucks, that's great. I'm at 20%. But if I do 100 and my payroll is at $30,000, that's 30%. Do you see? Because I'm accepting lowered fees. And the reason why that happens is because nobody there's nobody else accounting for the fact that you're accepting a reduced fee for your for your services. You're not your, your assistant isn't taking a 30 or 40 percent haircut on their hourly salary because you're working on a PPO patient. Your landlord doesn't charge you less. The the power company doesn't charge you less. You don't get a cheaper crown because it's a PPO patient. Like the lab doesn't go, oh, it's a PPO patient. Let me write 40 percent off. Nobody writes anything off except you. Okay. So this is where that could become problematic. And excuse, you may think, wow, I'm overstaffed because I'm spending all this money on payroll. But in fact, what's actually happening is you're actually just not charging enough for your services and therefore it skews your payroll percentage. So that's why ultimately uh, the thing you got to do is get out of these things. And you know, I've said before for years, we kind of took a little bit of a laissez-faire approach with clients. You know, hey, you should really get out of PPO is be a good idea. And some did and they had big wins. But since 2020, we've been pushing this very hard because, you know, since March of 2020 to now, the uh, overall inflation rate, compounded inflation, has been over 21%. That's the official number, which means it's probably wrong, right? It's probably a lot higher. Uh, and remember, that official number is an average of a bunch of things. So things like healthcare and telecom and education haven't gone up 21%, but gas and food and power all have gone up over 21%, right? So 
uh, you're in a situation where costs are going up. In a lot of cases, especially if you're involved in PPOs, they've reduced your reimbursement. So you hit a point where something has to give. And that will screw up your overhead percentages because in theory, you produced 150, but you really didn't produce 150. You produced 100 because you're accepting lowered fees. So you can't survive with like this long term. It's not ideal. So my suggestion, get out of the PPOs. If you want help with that or any assistance, we do offer a consultation called a PPO exit strategy session. It's free. You know, you don't have to do anything. There's no obligation. But we can point out to you what would be involved in you you getting out. Uh, I'll put a link to it on the episode webpage if you'd like to find out more and check it out. Last point before I forget to mention, I mentioned that the staff payroll figure should be 22.5%, including payroll taxes, excluding the doctor and the associate. That's in the United States. If you are outside the United States in Canada or elsewhere, that payroll percentage should be 20.9% not including employer payroll taxes, okay, if that makes sense. So if you're in Canada, it's 20.9 for the actual salaries plus payroll taxes, okay? Anyway, so that's some general insight. Those are the things that I'm looking at or checking when I'm looking at how staffed somebody is. I mean, there's always egregious situations when you see if someone's over or understaffed. I remember looking at one situation where, you know, the doctor, it was him and an assistant in the back, and they had an office manager and three front desk staff. I'm like, what do these people even do all day? This makes no sense, right? They were obviously overstaffed at the front. I've seen the reverse, too, where there's three doctors and six hygienists and you know six dental assistants and two people up front. They, they, they don't have enough people at the front administratively to actually support the technical staff at that point. These people at the front look like they were losing their minds. They look stressed out of their minds just due to the incoming traffic. And then it, you know what was worse is when they ended up with huge holes on the schedule, they looked terrible because you know they just didn't have time to keep up with it all. But those are the basic things that I would look at or that I'd recommend you look at. You have to understand, I know maybe that's kind of a, a little bit too easy of an answer, but you have to understand how these positions at the front work. You have to understand the stuff that they handle coming into the office, as well as the traffic when it's in the office, as well as what they're supposed to be doing with outgoing traffic to make sure that the office stays busy. Anyway, hope that helps. That's all I have for you this week. Don't forget on the episode webpage, I have that hygiene formula download as well as a link to that uh, PPO exit strategy session. Definitely recommend you take advantage of it because some of these PPOs take a while to get out of. So the sooner you start, the sooner you're done. If you have any questions about MGE or you'd like to find out more about us, you can find us online at mgeonline.com or call us at 800-640-1140. Folks, have a great week and we'll see you the next episode.